welcome to Concrete Conversations, the Indian real estate podcast. I'm Akshay. And I'm Yash. And we're the hosts of the show. One of the most subjective areas of a home is its interior design. We all have different ideas, tastes and preferences, but what unites us is that translating our ideas to a physical space can often prove to be a Herculean task. Today's guest, Cliff Tan, is a London-based architect and an expert at simplifying this daunting process. With over 15 years of experience working at firms such as Woha Architects and Heatherwick Studio, today he has his own practice, Dear Modern, which focuses on space planning and optimization based on feng shui principles. You can also catch him on Instagram and TikTok at Dear Modern, making content to explain the basics of feng shui and interior design, which even led him to start an affordable remote consultation service to cater to a global clientele. So if you want to know how you can get the most out of your home interiors on a budget or want to know how feng shui can help you design a better home, we guarantee that by the end of this episode, we'll be able to quote Cliff and say, So now you know. So Cliff, thank you so much for joining us on Concrete Conversations. How are you doing and how is your morning in London? I'm very good. Thank you for having me on your show. Well, the pleasure is ours. I think one of the things that the audience would love to know about is your journey. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got started as an architect and what led you to founding Dear Modern? Ah, okay. So I I started out like many architects do. We first have a little dream about building. So we <laughs> there's always some kind of passion behind, uh, behind it when it comes to architecture and design. We started. I I started uh, in in school. I love drawing. Um, I love buildings, and so I thought, oh, okay, I want to be an architect. <laughs> <laughs> I left school, and I I went to a polytechnic to do um a diploma uh in in architect. And then I went on to studying architecture at the Architecture Association in London. So it's a very famous school. I was so excited to get into it. And after that, I did some practice. I worked in various companies. The the most notable one was Hathaway Studio, where I spent a few years there and worked on a few large projects. And it it started to feel like just uh, another job i compare it to oh it's like a bank job you know you just come into office log into your computer and work 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 and then you go home it's not like what you dreamed of when you were young with all that passion right so i i left and and i started my own company called dear modern to to do architecture and it was still very conventional i was still trying to find customers clients to design their houses because that's all you know right that's that's how architecture works right. right and it was only recently during the pandemic when social media really took off tiktok came about and i i started using tiktok and i saw people sharing information which i thought was quite intriguing and so i thought okay i want to share something too and i know architecture there's very few people sharing about architecture it's a bit nerdy but why not <laughs> there, there must be a small crowd to to understand to, to want to know it so i I, I talked about architecture, but there's this interesting thing about me in that I, I'm so I'm from Singapore and in East Asia there's a lot of we, we practice this thing called feng shui, right? Which is very um, commonly practiced. It is part and parcel of building and of life. Mm. And I, I happen to have some connections with feng shui, so I, I I learned about it very much and I always incorporate it into my designs subconsciously as well. I don't purposely like tell my client, oh, we are going to do this feng shui thing. <laughs> I just do it because that's how it is. It's like gravity to me. It's like that's how it is. <laughs> right. And I thought, okay, that's the first thing that I could talk about because it's quite interesting. I live in London now. I realize people don't use it so much. So let's give some simple introduction to feng shui. Right. And to my surprise, people loved it. I mean, not that they loved it. They were very intrigued by it. They really wanted to know more. And I mean, I mean, I think it's safe to say that people loved it. I know we absolutely love your videos and the content that you post. Yeah, we absolutely love it. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, so so it, it it seemed to be helpful enough for people to validate me saying more. So I started talking more about it, and and that's where I am now. It it just changed the whole trajectory of where I was going. Right. right. Um. How did content creation? And all of this content being put out lead to uh, remote design consultations, which is something that you undertake now as well, right? Yes. Yeah, so first, very interestingly, um, TikTok has this algorithm where where it, it, it pumps videos to people almost randomly. Mm. So like that, you are able to reach an uh, an unex un unexpected audience, people who are not out looking for you. Hmm. 
And so I was able to reach an audience that was not looking for me and never knew they wanted to know more about Feng Shui. And they were able to reach out to me to say that, oh, I'm so interested in what you're talking about. Oh, I have this problem and that problem. And that made me realize that there was this need out there. People did want advice. They did want help. And I was like cracking my head on how can I do this? Because I'm practicing in a very traditional way. If an architecture firm, normally you, you have a client, they hire you, you sign a big contract, you stay with them for two years to build their house. Right. But these people, they are not that kind of client. They are like students or just people who moved into their first apartments and they just want a little help hmm. so so they were asking me questions on instagram and i was initially trying to help as much as i could but then it got completely out of control <laughs> uh, there was too many people messaging and i just could not cope with all the messages and i couldn't reply right and i actually asked my followers i asked them tell me what can i do so people were saying oh why don't you start um an account for people to donate or have a a, a website that people can make bookings so i i tried that i made a website site where people can book to see me almost like a GP <laughs> like, a, like a doctor they can see me for, for an hour and I can give them some ideas and I started this website and it worked people started to book I was surprised I so we, we, we started making virtual consultations I could meet people online hmm. and they showed me their, their apartments and I've done this for about a year not very long but through this time I've seen over 500 different apartments and different clients Wow! Uh, and, and it's just going to get better the more I see and I've seen houses from all over the world it's very very interesting that's fantastic and I, I gotta ask you you know you post these videos on Instagram where you have these little models that you make and you use to show different layouts on various floor plans uh, are these models uh, something that you've made yourself and uh, or does the client have to send you uh, some schematics first? How does the how does this work? <laughs> Okay, so the, the little models are mine. They came from my school and they, they were the first things that I used. You see them in my very, very earliest videos. I have always been using these models to explain how to put furniture, hmm. how to place them in the house. Right. And they, they came from my school project. They were made to scale. I 3D printed them myself. Oh, nice. And they've been following me ever since. And they are so good because my models are all little white pieces. People have commented, oh, it looks like butter. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're really small pieces of furniture and being white, they are generic enough for people to imagine and apply their perspective onto the models because different people have different styles, right? Right. So people can see these models and imagine the style that they like onto the models and they can immediately picture their home within these little models. And I will ask people for their floor plans and I'll, I know the scale of my models and I'll scale their floor plans to match my models. And so I can transport them into their own home through my camera and move their furniture around and say, okay, do this, do that, move your bed here, move your bed there. And they understand immediately. It becomes very easy. And, and it, it, especially for people who are not well versed with normal architectural plans, having something that's really tactile and three dimensional makes it so much easier. That's so true. And as you said, different people have different styles one of the things you probably have an answer to since you work with clients around the world is how universal is design sense design is a funny thing because everyone has taste they have something that they like something that they don't like and the design is like distilling taste into something that's tangible so people are sometimes influenced by what they see on Instagram. They see a nice picture or they go to a nice hotel and they say, oh, I love this hotel. I want it to look like that. And, and so they, a lot of the times I'm trying to understand what they like, which they don't even know. These customers, they are not design-oriented people. They are just people who know a nice space, a nice place, and they aspire to live in a nice home. Right. And they just want something nice. And I'm like, what's nice? You know, <laughs> there's many types of niceness. And very often they say they, they don't know what their style is so I'm, I am I need to ask them things okay so have you been to any hotels that you like or have you been to any restaurants that you like or very easily I can show them up, show them pictures of various interiors and they will say okay I hate this I hate that I like this right. and so I try to build this picture in my head and give it back to them mm. and then that's when they're like oh, yes I love it so it's, it's very interesting to, to learn about this psychology about the design because when you ask people what do you like they always say the same I want something elegant. I want something calming. Like, what do these <laughs> words mean? Right. <laughs> yeah. No, 
definitely. And I wanted to ask you, since you work with such a diverse clientele, like you said, you know, maybe they don't, they're not your typical client that architects tend to deal with, or, you know, they're from different parts of the world. Are there any interesting projects uh, or any projects that you found really interesting that you've worked on while doing these consults? Well, I- indeed, my client base is very diverse. I I see people from all walks of life, mm. like fresh students in their dorms asking me how to arrange their furniture and they can't afford anything. Mm. And I have people who live in big mansions. So like, okay, you, we, we, we all know this, like the furniture brand IKEA, right? right? To some people, it is very cheap. To some people, it is quite expensive. Mm. Right. So before we get into anything, you need to really understand and empathize with your clients. It's not like, it's not just about asking what's your budget because it's a very what's your budget is a very difficult question to ask. Right. It's more like understanding them, talk to them. Sometimes you can you can kind of get it. So it's it's in that sense that's interesting to learn about their lifestyles and you get people with tons of clutter. And the clutter also there's a reason for that. Some of them they are depressed because life is not treating them nicely so Mm. it's a bit of a downward spiral you get clutter you can't deal with it it becomes it makes your house messy and tired and you don't want to come home it just gets worse and worse and worse so sometimes you don't even talk about design you talk about how to live life right so that's one end of the scale on the other end i have people with big big houses they they the house is too big they don't know how to furnish it they buy all these expensive things that don't match and and so it's it's like trying to to explain to them like okay your house is amazing the taste is questionable we need to look into <laughs> we need to see how we can I- improve uh, the 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 flow of things and maybe it's as simple as swapping furniture around the house and just getting them to match hmm. um, so what I do is not really helping them design it's more like looking at what they have right. looking at what they're willing to spend what they're willing to change and trying to work with them to make their homes nicer because it's not always about gutting out an apartment and redoing the whole thing so often you can do things with as little waste as possible yeah i i completely understand you know and which is why it's such an interesting uh take on the way an architectural business is run also because there's so much more that you're doing than just giving maybe a layout or a plan to someone right Indeed, like there are a few projects where I I was able to do a little bit more Um, and those are are projects where people are rebuilding their house or doing major renovations and they they are able to do structural changes and that's when I can tap onto my original architectural knowledge. Like when we try to make apartments, you want to make it livable and nice and these things get me excited. Right. Right. We know you work uh, with clients all over the world, like you said, you know, diversified client base and um, I know that maybe, you know, things are different country to country, like Akshay spoke about, you know, how universal can design sense be, but are there any general tips you would have for people to optimize the kind of space they're currently living in, whether that's in terms of light, colors, you know, ventilation or anything like that? Well, yes. Um, so regardless of how diverse this world is and all the different types of apartments and houses and spaces there are, there are always a few rules that we must remember. And that, that kind of brings us back to feng shui because feng shui is about this natural tendency to feel nice in your in the environment around you so for example if you sleep in a bedroom you must have a window some ventilation you don't want to sleep in a windowless room for example if you are in the kitchen you want to have lots of ventilation as well because of the cooking right um and if, if you are in a living room it needs to be even more open and social so the bedroom needs to be in a more quiet part of the home but still have ventilation, but more quiet, more secluded part, whereas the living and dining rooms are more in the open side of things. And also when you enter the home, that should feel welcoming. So there are a few things that we must always remember in, in order to make a successful and attractive home. Perfect. You mentioned feng shui and I, I thought that this would be a good point for us to kind of discuss that. So if you could just tell us, you know, from a beginner's perspective, for someone who maybe has no knowledge of what this is, that what is feng shui and how does it incorporate into design? Ah, so feng shui is very misunderstood. Not say misunderstood, but not understood. <laughs> so it is this ancient practice um, it, to create the, the best possible environment for you. It started off as, as finding the best spaces places for cemeteries actually oh. uh, for burial grounds but uh, it eventually evolved to become a, a kind of science or, or logic behind building a house or bu- even building a city okay so it's a lot about 
feeling protected and feeling open. So wh- wh- wherever you are, you want to have this sense of protection that nobody can pounce on you from the back. And that's why that's where this term called the command position comes about. Where you want to be in a room with a stable wall behind you. So you don't want your back against a door or window. And you want to be able to see most of the room in front of you. And you want to be able to see the door ahead. Okay. And wherever there are doors and openings, these things bring in energy. What do we mean by that? Like anything, like the potential for someone to run in or light or ventilation. It, it, it sounds like woohoo or, or, or weird and superstitious, but it's just about... It's just the difference between a completely concealed room and a room full of windows. You can feel the difference in the vibes. A room is a room, but with lots of windows, you feel the difference. And that is the kind of energy we're talking about. It can come in many forms. Mm. Like, for example, a room with many windows on the 10th floor versus a room with many windows on the ground floor. The ground floor feels even more exposed because you know that people can walk past, they can walk through. Right. So energy is not just about light and ventilation, it's about many other things, the potential for someone to walk in. And that is my simplest explanation of what this energy is. And um, I, I mean, I, I guess that's why people kind of like to watch my videos because I try to explain it in a way that makes it easier for them to, the layman to understand. <laughs> no, definitely. Cliff, I wanted to move back to something you touched upon earlier, which is IKEA. And I think IKEA is especially relevant for the Indian audience because it recently opened in India and even more recently in Mumbai, the second IKEA store opened. And it's this large store, which in typical IKEA fashion has become this novelty experience for families to sort of go there and check out the different settings and the furniture and learn about this do-it-yourself uh, concept that IKEA has brought to the world. With brands like IKEA, with the advent of social media, with platforms like Pinterest and Instagram, do you find that there's a a greater standardization of design preferences and tastes across your global clientele? Or do you still feel that the local culture has a great impact on your client's taste and preference when it comes to design? Okay, this is a very interesting question. And... Let, let's start with IKEA. Um, okay, I don't work for IKEA. Many people think I work for IKEA because I keep talking about them. <laughs> but the, the reason I talk about IKEA is, is because it's a, a furniture shop that I have access to, you have access to, many people have access to, and so it brings us common ground. When people ask me, oh, where should I buy my furniture? I say, I, I don't know. I'm not from there. I don't know what to recommend. The only thing I can, that I do know is IKEA, and that's what I have and you have, and so we I can find things that fit your dimensions. But more than that, really, I'm from what used to be a developing developing country, which is Singapore. And back then, furniture is is, is seen as a piece of utility. Right. You you know, like furniture, you you, you need it to live. It's, it, it's nothing special, nothing designed. It's not about style. You have your home. Home is a shelter and you try to make it work for you. And so you buy a chair, you buy a bed, things like that. When IKEA came to Singapore, it was like the first, the first ever foray into design for us is because they care about design. The Scandinavian people, they care about design, which Asian people do not. <laughs> and so whenever you go to IKEA, it's like, wow, it's so beautiful. All their rooms are so nicely laid out because a, a standard furniture shop is just stacks of beds, stacks of chairs. <laughs> right. Whereas IKEA was very different. They create little, little environments, little homes for you to imagine yourself living in them. Very cozy, very nice. And it, it, it just opened that window for us to realize that, oh, okay, actually, we can make our home nice and we should make our home nice and there's nothing pretentious about it. Right. Furniture is not just utility. There's more than that. There is this joy to making a home look and feel good. Right. And I can relate to that because uh, in India, for example, until recently, most of the furniture was kind of custom made for a lot of people. And like you said, it's, it's with utility in mind. It's made to last, especially in India. You want furniture that's going to last for the ages and that's the first priority. So maybe it is a shift in terms of thinking of the home and that space in a different way. Yes, definitely. And and yes, uh, as I speak to different clients, I also see this difference between uh, the custom made and the ready built. So people in the West, they cannot afford custom made. It's custom made things are super expensive. They have to buy ready made. They have to buy IKEA. Whereas people in like in, in Asia, they a lot of them they are very ready to do custom made things. In fact, it's sometimes cheaper, more affordable than ready-made furniture. So I think that's also another difference that we need to bridge. So we were just speaking about, you know, uh, these cultural differences and how we kind of have to adjust to that when looking at design. So when talking about uh, 
maybe a new home buyer as a use case uh, how do you think people should go about you know interpreting floor plans so if they're looking to buy a house how should they visualize those interiors or do you think there's also a large cultural component to that as well so it, it is another thing to note that i i notice that people in asia are more ready to buy apartments off plan it, yeah. it, that means the buildings are not yet built they buy through looking at brochures and floor plans and hoping for the best <laughs> uh, whereas in in for example I, okay i've only lived in london so for example in in britain people cannot accept that they want to see an apartment before they buy or they find it quite crazy to buy something from a set of line drawings and not knowing how it actually feels yeah. and it's true because the floor plan is only two dimensions you you can't absolutely feel how it looks sometimes developers try to build um show flats and things yeah. but these are not that accurate they don't really reflect fully or 100% how a, a flat should look so you must really look into the floor plans carefully i would always ask advise people to not just look at the floor plans but look at the bigger picture look at the site plan find out where the apartment is in relation to all the buildings in relation to your neighbors so you can see how the view is where the light comes from hmm. and try to understand and imagine how your space might feel based on all these uh, factors right sometimes i'm asked to help them like manage this difference in expectation so people buy a house and they and they they realize it's much darker than they expected so they call me to say how can i make it brighter i'm very disappointed but you know it's in the contract they can't change it so there's always ways there's always there's always nice things about bad things like if the apartment is too small it means that it's a bit darker you can easily control the lighting you can make it feel more cozy more more um Uh, close and so th- th- there's always a way to make a home feel nice regardless of the the situation or the environment and you can always make the most of it right right and i think that moves us on to the next point which is when it comes to interior design there's different schools of thought and then one of the the schools of thought that has been fairly popular in recent times is the minimalist school of thought which says less is more in your opinion is less really more when it comes to interior design Minimalism is is a phase. It's actually a phase. So I mean, it, it started off many years ago when this architect called Adolf Loos he said that ornament is crime, and <laughs> what he meant was that the superfluous decoration that doesn't do anything is a bad thing because. Um, like for example, in the past, where you have Roman buildings, they have capitals and things. These are used. All those cornices and capitals are used to conceal the joinery. Right. And then, as as technology evolved, buildings don't need these things anymore. Mm. So you 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 could do like very simple rectangles, but people still stuck on all these decorations just to make it feel like the old fashioned thing. Mm-hmm. And that's why that's when he called ornament as crime because it is um, not sincere. It's fake. It's like it's like sticking a button on a shirt that doesn't need buttons to to attach it right and and that's how minimal, min, minimalism came about in that it, it it celebrated the purity of structure and struct and form but then people start to realize that minimalism became austere it became very boring it became very lifeless and characterless right then it's been the two groups the people who are seeing minimalism as a style and the people who seeing non minimalism as another style and it became a, a kind of um, stylistic choice so we have to remember that when you want to use minimalism is about quality is about having good quality finishes good quality craftsmanship if you cannot do that then the minimalism will fail and that's when decoration comes in to kind of fix it or cover it up so um it is a, a a little sticky point there to talk about minimalism because it is about um it is not just a style it's a, it's a it, there's a lot of things a lot of baggage that it carries hmm. and that is why when so, that is why sometimes you can see it being very successful as a design sometimes you see it not really working so well right and speaking of minimalism i'm sure you get this question asked a lot but i'm going to ask it anyways do you have any general tips for people looking to optimize their budget when it comes to interior design yes i always i always have these tips up my sleeves because people who find me they are always budget constrained <laughs> so the, the the best way to make a home look nice and spend the least amount of money is no is to know where to focus on right in every space there's always 
like things that you focus on that lead your eyes. So these are things such as your statement arm chairs, your chandeliers, your, your lamps. These things draw your attention or the artwork on the wall. And then there are the supporting the supporting pieces such as your consoles, your dressers, your storage units, your bedside tables, even the bed frames. These things are they are very big but they are meant to blend into the environment. They don't stand out. So these things you can go for something very simple, very cheap, right. not very cheap, but very simple, very <laughs> modest, and just blend to the background. Right. And then you have the mid-range pieces such as your, your dining tables and the sofas. So these things are a bit bigger. They are things that you actually interact with. So you want a bit of quality for those, just decent enough. Hmm. And then you spend the most on the statement pieces that go with you, that 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 have the longest lifespan, like your your chandelier, your art pieces. So when you step into a room, you will notice the statement pieces first. Even if they are very small, a, a chandelier compared to a sofa is very small, but hanging high up right in front of your face, you notice that first. Right. And that is where you spend your money, and then you spend, and and that's how you maximize your budget, creating something very interesting. Right. A nice space is not just nice, nice. So what do you mean by nice? It is about creating interest. It is about creating that that character to reflect yourself. So you choose things uh, that stand out and have some design that will draw your eye and attention, and then the the bigger pieces can just blend in, into the background. Right, that makes sense. And and you know, we since we're on this topic, in the last couple of years, I think a lot of people have had to maybe repurpose their own space and you know make they've had the motivation now to make that their space nice because they now spend most of their lives in that same space, working and living. So, do you think that the kind of work that you do, the consults and you know advising people on optimizing these spaces, do you think that there's going to be a growing need for that going forward? I think. The need has always been there and has always been a very, very big and like it's always been in high demand. It's just that people never knew where to go and their service never existed. Right. So it's about letting them know that this service does exist. It's about letting other architects know that they can offer a similar type of service because I can't I can't fix the whole world. <laughs> right. As far as I know, I'm the only person doing something like this. Right. And um, maybe no. Um, there are interior designers that do, but it's always packaged in a big um kind of contract. Right. You must always combine it with the actual work. So. I think there's definitely this need, this need, and definitely with the pandemic, especially people have realized that home is more than just a place to sleep. And also interestingly, because people are re repurposing their spaces, a lot of these people have existing furniture, and that is something that most designers are not very used to. Hmm. Most times, designers are used to blank canvases, a new apartment, empty land to build a new house. Uh, and it's rare that people have to deal with existing furniture or very, very, very tight budgets. Right. So you tend to, it's not so much about design, it's about doing a lot of makeshift work, trying to work with what you have hmm. and what your client has and trying to make things work together. Right. And that, that's the biggest challenge, but that's also the biggest value for people. And, I, and I'm sure that's the thing that they appreciate the most as well, because like you said, it's quite unique and it isn't really being offered anywhere else, right? It is. Um, so I, it just takes an eye and I'm trying to lend them my eye to see what they can reuse and make the most of. And I also have customers who just want to, to make the most value out of their properties. Like they want to sell a property, right? They want to sell their home. So it's about how they can stage it and make it look nice and make other buyers see the potential in that right perfect and and like you said you know at least that's one thing that i've really appreciated when i've seen your post is that you lend people your eye you give that perspective to them and you make it uh, using the models and everything in a very accessible way so it's also teaching people about these kind of fundamentals or like you know common sense things that you can do at making the most of what you have and still getting a nice place like you said yes yes that's true of course, the next thing that I wanted to uh, you know, talk to you about is your upcoming book, 
So, um, for those of our listeners that don't know, Cliff actually has a book coming out called Feng Shui Modern, which is releasing on the twentieth of Jan. I wanted to ask you, what made you uh, consider writing a book? Uh, you know, and what do you hope that your readers will gain from it? You know, I I never actually what uh, intended to write a book. It all came very unexpectedly. So I was approached by the publisher to write this book hmm. about Feng Shui, and I oh I always thought that there were enough books about Feng Shui on the market anyway. But I, I think it, it, it became clear to me now that they wanted me to write this book because of the very clear way I try to explain feng shui that makes anybody understand it. Right. And not just understand the rules, but understand why the rules exist. Because once you understand the logic, applying it becomes more natural. Hmm. And so I, I think this was why this book is slightly different, a bit more approachable for most people, especially those less well-versed with feng shui. So uh, yeah, as I say, it was quite unexpected, but I, I think it came out quite nicely. I, I was very very happy to see in print. <laughs> of course. And when it comes to feng shui, do you find that your Western clients respond better than your Eastern clients, or do you feel like now there's more of a bridge in the gap between the two? You know, the funniest thing is that it's my Asian Eastern clients that are learning more from me than the Western clients. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, in the West, they they are very used to having feng shui explained to them fairly simply, whereas the the Eastern side of things they take feng shui so seriously they fear for their lives almost like if they hmm. don't do th- something this way they will die tomorrow or something like that <laughs> so it, it is more like when they listen to my to, like uh, when I try to explain things to them they're like oh so that's how it works that's not so bad <laughs> because they start to see the logic the the, the fear starts to dissipate and it, it, it becomes more like a useful functional uh, kind of science rather than something that was very scary and, un- and, 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 and dark right uh, Yash I I think I think it's safe to say now we know. <laughs> so now you know. <laughs> perfect, perfect. The payoff we all had been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, all right. With that, Cliff, um, I think we've come to the end of our conversation today. But I must say, it's truly been enjoyable having you on the show. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here. We both have become fans of your content and the way you explain things. And we're so happy that you know you decided to come on and we had this conversation because I have learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners will have learned a lot as well. Oh, thank you, thank you. That's that's very nice to hear. And, and thanks for 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 reaching out to me. I, I mean, I I always love every opportunity to to talk and share whatever I can to to people who are interested. It's it's it's, it's just so nice to know that there are people interested. And yeah, I, I appreciate you reaching out. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to follow Concrete Conversations on Instagram to know more about upcoming episodes and for some behind the scenes content. For more deep dives into the world of Indian real estate, stay tuned for more Concrete Conversations.